and the clock strikes 10 o'clock and it's time to begin our webinar. Welcome everyone. We're so glad that you're here. We're so excited. This is such an important time in music education and this is such an important subject. And the fact that you would carve out an hour of your day to spend with us means the world to us and shows how committed you are to your student success. My name is Scott Lang and I'm the host for today's webinar. It's time to talk uncomfortable conversations during an unconventional time. You want to make sure before we begin the webinar that you go to joinsll.com. That's joinsll.com. You'll be able to not only download today's slide deck and print it out so you can take notes, but you'll be able to see all of our previous resources and links to our webinars as well as our leadership offerings. This is our ninth webinar in the COVID series and maybe our most important important one of all time. Now understand that every webinar is going to be different and every situation is different. The content and the information that we share might apply differently for band than it does for choir or choir for it does for orchestra. It might look different in a rural setting than it does in an urban setting. And it also might be different whether you teach elementary school, middle school, I have done my homework and I have visited the CDC websites and I've read all the information and I'm combining my experience as a music educator with all the information that's out there. So please understand, you need to take the information I'm about to share and apply it in a way that's responsible and applicable to your setting. Second thing I wanna say is just that we can't control what we can't control. We're not gonna be able to control what our, our, our national government does. We're not gonna be able to control what our state government does. We likely won't even be able to have that much influence over our local, uh, our local governing boards, but we can control what we can control. And what we wanna do is prepare starting today for what's coming because what's coming is gonna be a significant impact on not just education, but music education and specifically. very uncomfortable. And I call it the Z to A effect and the Harbinger effect. It's likely that there are some scenarios that started leaking out last Friday, which actually started this whole process and got me fired up. Last Friday, the a State Association of Missouri Governing Boards released a report in which they recommended in their 97 page proposal that there'll be no activities, no music, no PE. About two hours later, the governor of Maryland released a similar step-by-step -step opening process for the schools in his state that had similar recommendations. And I got fired up because it wasn't based in fact, it wasn't based in science, and it wasn't based in good decision-making. And I call it, well, there's an effect out there uh, that was coined after TSA got audited by the GAO, Government Accountability Office. And they tried to get weapons through TSA to find out how efficable and how effective they were. 93% of weapons got through TSA, 93%. So the coin that was termed was it's security theater. It's a great show. There's lots of blue shirts walking around and lots of money being spent in lots of machines, but it's not doing what its intended effect was, which was to make the airlines a safer place to fly. Pandemic theaters are occurring. There's lots of things going on. There's lots of people running around. There's lots of big proposals but they're not based in good data and they're not based in good science. So what we're seeing is administrators and governing boards and, and state and local officials coming out with Z, we must cut, 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 cut. And I'm at A. I'm gonna make a logical mathematical case today that says, if you love children, if you believe in what's best for children, and if you believe in mathematical data and good science, then not only do you have to have music, but every child must be in music. I couldn't be further away from your spectrum. I'm at A, you're at Z. Now, am I likely to get my local governor to go from Z to A? No, probably not. 
But if I can get my governing board, my local school board, my administrator, my activities director, my superintendent to go from Z to M by standing firm at A, then I'm gonna make some real progress today. So understanding that, what we're trying to do is make a mathematical, logical, rational case that says, if you believe in children, if you believe in want what's best for children, then you will make sure every child is enrolled in music every child. But beyond that, we have to talk in the language that they understand. Now, it's really uncomfortable to say this, but students are the currency of the educational process, not just financially, but musically. Um, with every student in the state of Arizona, which is where I live, $7,200 follows that child. So when that child enrolls in the school, the school gets $7,200 to educate that child. But musically, you know, if you want better clarinets, get more clarinets. If you want an assistant choir director, get more kids involved in choir. If you want bigger facilities and better budget, you've got to get more kids enrolled in your program. The bottom line is simply this. Musically and financially speaking, students are the currency of the educational process. Now, the Harbinger effect says that people, quant uh, people travel in groups of people that share similar beliefs, that if you are a Coke lover, there's a pretty good chance you surround yourself with other Coke lovers. If you are a nut for athletics, you probably spend time with, um, with people who, 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 um, who love athletics. The Harbinger says that water finds like water. And when all of these, all of these proposals came out and that said that we may be cutting this or we may be doing this or this state's doing this, I turned to my wife and I said, you're about to see the pillaging of the public school system. I guarantee it. And she was like, I, what are you saying? I, here's the problem, I told her. I said, with, with the privatization of our, pub, of our public school system, with the addition of private schools, uh, religious-based, faith-based schools, with the addition of charter schools, online schools, um, what we're seeing is that, that people are being segmented and they're being drawn to the places in which they uh, share like values. And I said, what's gonna happen, Leah, is that the minute the public schools come out and say, well, we, we can't make, let's say, athletics work. We can't figure out a, a way to do football safely. I guarantee you within 30 hours, there'll be a billboard on the corner of that, of that corner saying, Smith Private School, we figured out a way to make it work. And every kid who believes in sports and athletics and football will transfer the next day. I guarantee it. I guarantee you, we've already got students who transfer states to participate in programs. You don't think they'll drive two miles away. You don't think they'll go two blocks away. You don't think that they'll make a different zip code jump to get a program that they love. And it was all hypothetical when I said it on Tuesday. On Wednesday, on Wednesday, the mayor of Los Angeles um, stated that he didn't believe that schools would open with a full complement of athletics or activities program. On Thursday morning, in the headline of the sports section of the Arizona Republic were the following headlines. Arizona Nevada coaches flooded with emails from athletes wanting to transfer to Arizona. What we're about to see is the pillaging of the public school system. Because the moment, the moment we say we can't do something, then we know that someone will come out and say we can and people will flock to that. If we can't make music work, then someone will and that's where those kids will go. And the damage will be immense and it will be long term because when those athletes leave and they go to a different school, then when they figure out how to make athletics work, when they reopen athletics the following year, all of the athletes will have left the school and they will be building from scratch while the sister school will be an athletic powerhouse. The bottom line is simply this, we are framing the question wrong. We are framing the question wrong. It's not, what can we do that's safe? That's the wrong way to think about this problem. The correct way to think about this problem is, what do we want our school to look like? Is AB important? Is IB important? Are honors classes important? Are the arts, are the activities important? Are athletics important? What do we want our school to look like? And when we understand what's important, then we figure out how to make it safe. The question isn't what's safe for kids. The question is what's right for kids and how do we make it safe? I'm gonna make a mathematical scientific based case that says if you love children, every child should be in music. And if you don't put a music thing, you don't love children, but it's got to be based in the understanding of fact and data and science. And we've got to understand that we've got to think creative and get out of the box and not run in fear. 
No one remembers the person who runs out of the burning building. The hero is the one who runs into the burning building and saves people. I'm not interested in the conversation of what's safe for kids. I'm interested in the conversation of what's right for kids and how do we make it safe. My local school board is talking about, well, we're going to split the day in half, A and B. And I sit there and I go, that makes no sense to me. Because if Billy is dating Sally and Billy's in the A block and Sally's in the B block and after school they hold hands, we've now cross-contaminated contamin the population. If they work at the same place, if they're in the same club activity, if they go to a party on Friday night, we've done all of this pandemic theater. We've rearranged our school system for absolutely no scientific and mathematical benefit. We're going to social distance. We're going to shrink our classes and I want to be safe and I want to do what's right for kids. And that's fantastic until the passing period bell rings and we flood them into a hallway that's only 12 feet wide. Until they walk out to the parking lot and hang out by their cars. Until they go to their after school job and work with someone who's already cross contaminated. We've got to do whatever it takes to make kids safe, but only if it makes kids safe not for the sake of pandemic theater. The theme of today is not how do we keep kids safe? The theme of today is what is the best experience for kids and how do we make them safe? You're at Z, I'm at A. Let's get to the start of the alphabet. Because in the end, when you say to a principal, if you don't have activities, if you don't have arts, if you don't have athletics, then your honors program is done. Your, AP program is done. Your national merit semifinalists are gone. It's more than just music. And then the last thing I think we really want to talk about is not just the total experience of kids, but why that experience is important. I was on the phone with a friend of mine because I vetted this, this, uh, this presentation with uh, two doctors, um, a pharmaceutical expert, and some educators. Um, and I was talking with a friend of mine who's a science teacher. And she teaches at a local high school and she said, but Scott, you know, you don't understand and we've got to slow the curve and we've got to do all these things. I said, no, I get all that. But I walked her through the problematics of, of parking lots and parties and jobs and she understood that. And then, and I didn't know the answer when I said this to her. I said, um, Tracy, um, have you lost a student during this pandemic? And she said, yes. I said, okay. Before I answer the next question, I want to know what's the mathematical probability of a child being sick. And she said it's about, and, and, and being terminally sick, she said it's about 0.02%. I said, okay. So if you have a thousand kids in your school, um, it's, it's conceivable that two students could become gravely ill and seriously, um, seriously sick. And she said, yes, that is correct. I said, okay. Now I'm going to go back to my first question, Tracy. So have you lost any students? during this COVID pandemic. And she said, yes, I've lost two. And I said, to what? She said, suicide. I said, Tracy, that's my point. If we don't give these kids something that's healthy for their minds and their souls, we may lose more kids to suicide than we do to the COVID pandemic. That mathematically speaking, it may be more critical that we reopen our programs, more critical that we reopen athletics, more critical that we reopen the arts, the activities and the expression-based um, things that we do in schools because it's mathematically possible we'll lose more kids, not to COVID, but to suicide. You're at Z, I'm at A. I'm not interested in the conversation of what's safe. I'm interested in the conversation of what matters. And then we'll figure out how to make it safe. So we know that, that we have to start these uncomfortable conversations. And when we do these, we have to keep these in mind. We have to understand music and arts are not just a, a critical part of a well-rounded curriculum, but the entire school experience. I talked to my nephew, Matthew, uh, last night. He is uh, um, uh, a senior in high school. And uh, my brother called me a couple days ago. He said, Matthew's pretty down. It's, it's bad. I'm like, I'm going to take him out for a burger. Arizona opened up Saturday. I called him up and said, Matthew, bud, I'm gonna, Uncle Scott's coming to grab you. We're going to go get a burger Tuesday or Wednesday night. He said, okay, great. And he's a great kid great kid. And we're hanging out in the back of our car. We took it out to go and we're eating our burger. And I said, how are you doing? He goes, not good, Uncle Scott. And I go, why? And he goes, it's not good to play video games 10, or 10, 14 hours a day. I go, I know, bud. I know. He goes, but I'm not seeing anyone. And I go, okay. And he goes, a little girl in your life? He goes, no. And I go, I go, that's too bad. And he goes, no one calls and checks up on me. 
No one asks if I'm doing okay. No one sends me a text at 11 at night and says, I'm thinking of you. I'm completely alone. And it broke my heart. He needs that high school experience. He needs his friends. And music and the arts are a part of that social emotional wellness that we know is key, is key to not just brain development, but human development. And until you can prove to me otherwise, I can prove to you that math, uh, mathematically speaking, that music can not only be taught safely, but I'm actually gonna make an argument. Music is the safest place in our school system today. I'm at A, in fact, I may be pre-A. I may be in the number side of the bracket. Music is the safest place in our school system today. And I will engage with you and I will talk with you and I will be solutions-based, but I will not engage or accept pandemic theater. Everything we do has to be rational and has to be based in science and facts. So if we know that, we got to talk about the five phases really quick. So phase one was the first two weeks. Oh my God, schools are closed. What are we going to do? We could do online ensembles. We could, it was the what if period. And it was, it was, dare I say, exciting. You know, a brave new world. Phase two is the second two weeks. And when people went, oh crud. My principal actually says, I have to have curriculum online by Friday. Oh my gosh, how am I gonna do this online ensemble? Oh my goodness, I've done it, now what do I do? That this is real. Uh, the third phase uh, finished what I would say last Friday. And it was the, okay, I've done this for six weeks and it's not fun. I don't like teaching. I didn't sign up to stare at a computer screen 16 hours a day to get 10 minutes of teaching done. I don't like this and the kids don't like it. And then phase four, which is what started last Friday, which is, and this isn't going away, it's coming back. And I can't tell you how, what, when, where the duration, but what I can tell you is this is gonna come back. Uh, I don't know if we're looking at split schedules. I don't know if we're looking at no schedule. I don't know what we're looking at, but I know it's not coming back and I've got to plan for it. And then the final phase is when students return um, in the fall. Now. There are four contingencies. I'm not gonna read them to you, but it's basically one, uh, changes will be minor to your program. Two, changes will have some impact on your program. Three, changes to your program will be significant. It will be delayed, it will be split. You won't have an activity, you won't have choir, you won't, and uh, possible contingency four is that we don't even open our schools in the fall or we open them in the fall and then they suddenly shut down in mid-September. But the bottom line is we need to be acting today to prepare for each of those contingencies. We will put a plan in place starting today. And when you get off this webinar today, we will, within 30 minutes, I will give you an actual guide to begin this process today. Because I promise you, these conversations are being had by people who are at Z. So the people who are at A have got to get off the couch. It is time to get off the couch. We are not victims. You know who the victims are? The people who are sitting in a hospital bed right now, they're a victim. The people on ventilators, they're victims. The people who've lost a loved one, they're victims. We are not victims. We are active, willing participants. And if we sit by idly and allow people to make decisions with not without relevant information, then we are as much culpable in the crime as anyone else. If I sit by and watch a robbery occur and I don't call 911, I'm just as culpable as the burglar. If I sit by and watch someone pillage the public schools and do nothing, I am just as culpable as the person pillaging it. And that is what will happen. Music and the public schools are what's right with this country. And I'm not going to engage in pandemic theater. It's time to get off the couch and get to work. So here's the plan. Number one, you've got to start and become a part of the process. We're going to insert ourselves in the decision-making process. Number two, we're going to build a consortium because we're better together than we are apart. And I mean athletics, activities, K-12, sister school districts, entire state MEAs. We are going to build a consortium. Step three, we're going to become educated. We're going to collect data. We cannot expect our administrators to know everything about instrument cleaning and square footage of our facilities and appropriate um, distancing and how we run a rehearsal and how we scope and stagger. We are the experts. It's incumbent upon us to become educated experts and collect data that validates what we believe to be true. Then we've got to be solutions-based. 
we cannot go to our administrative team. We cannot go to our district office. We cannot go to our local politicians and say, we have a problem and we don't know how to fix it. No, we say, you have the problem. We have the solution. Here you are. We must become the experts in our field and become solutions-based. And then we have to communicate it vertically and horizontally up and down our chain, K-12 district office, governing board, governor, and laterally across every, every curricula, band, choir, orchestra, across sister districts, across sister states. Step one begins today. It's time to become a part of the process. So as we do that, number one, when you're done, you're gonna set up a meeting this weekend with your administrator. Now, I'm gonna send you that email to send to your administrator. Everything you need is gonna go out Sunday. The next four emails. We had the first four, then we had the next four. The final four emails are gonna go out this Sunday. It's gonna tell you exactly what to say, who to say it, when to say it, and how to say it. Even if you don't have the answers, set the meeting up for Tuesday and get the answers before then. Step two, you've got to get the answers. You have to establish credibility. Listen, Mr. Principal, I know you're struggling with a lot of stuff and I know you've got a lot on your plate. Let me help you. Let me help you. I'm an expert in this field. I'm already I've already dealt with social distancing. I, under I already understand spacing. I've already thought about square footage of facilities. I already deal with cleaning of instruments. I already deal with cleaning of facilities. I run a program. I understand budgeting. Let me help you. Let me be a part of your solutions-based team. I'm doing this already as a program director established credibility. I am the expert. I have educated myself. I'm active on local and national blogs. I've done my research. I've thought through these processes for my facility and my program so I can help you think through them through your facilities and your programs and communicate clearly and vertically. Brief, bullet-pointed communiques to everyone, everyone in your vertical chain, everyone in your department, everyone in your school, everyone in your administrative team, everyone in your, your district office, everyone in your governing board. You've got to start the engagement process now and let them know that you're there to help and you are solutions-based and, and that you understand that if we lose the arts, we lose the best kids in our schools and they're not coming back that you're here to help them save their schools. You're here to help them solve their problems. You're here to help them build a better high school, a better middle school, a better elementary school. You're not there for just you. You're there for them. Build the coalition. Start to engage in that process. So we've already started to communicate. We've already built all that information. We've inserted ourselves in the conversation. We've done it uh, uh, horizontally with our department, with our curricula, with our colleagues, with our local teachers. We've done it vertically, elementary school teachers, middle school teachers, people in our building, our building administrators, our um, district office administrators and our governing board. Now that we've done that, we've got them, we're on their radar and we've inserted ourselves saying, we've got to be a part of the decision-making process is how we do, of how we do this. Now, now we've got to go to work quickly and build a coalition. That coalition has to involve your parents. It has to involve your students. It has to involve whatever boards that you work with. You've got to start thinking through physical and financial materials. It's got to involve other music teachers you've got to start dialoguing with the football coach, the volleyball coach. You've got to start dialoguing with the drama teacher. The more voices that speak, the louder we speak and the, the further away we're heard. The more voices that speak, parents, students, colleagues, community members, the more seriously we'll be taking. You want to build a coalition of anybody and everybody that might be impacted by the decisions being made regarding the restarting of school. Even if you have access to local influencers or music stores, you want to cast that net as far and wide as possible. Now it's easy to segment it. Well, for this part of it, we only need to deal with the music teachers. And for this part of it, we want to include the coaches or the drama teacher or the middle school teacher or the administrators. Segmenting, segmenting that coalition is easy to do. But building it will take some time and effort. And the problem is, it's like a car. You can't say, well, I got to go to the store. We have no food and we're in desperate need of food. 
oh, there's a bunch of parts. I should probably build the car. No, you got to build the car now so you're ready to drive it. Because when you need to mobilize the coalition, you'll need to hit go now. You'll need to be able to go immediately. Well, the governing board meetings tomorrow night, they're making, oh my gosh, good thing we have our coalition built. Good thing we've gathered, gathered our data. And we've become educated. Good thing we're mobilized and ready to go. We have email lists. We have segmentation. We have team leaders. Build the coalition now so you can activate it and spread it as far wide horizontally, cross curricula in your school, outer school, and as wide vertically, teachers, parents, governing board members, politicians, as you possibly can. And approach it as a we us. What's good for athletics is good for the arts. What's good for the arts is good for the activities. What's good for the activities is good for kids. It's good for kids. And that's why we do what we do. Okay, so we talked about number one, you gotta get involved in the process. Step number two, you've gotta build your coalition vertically and horizontally. Next step is we gotta educate ourselves. We have to become the experts in our area and we have to collect relevant and clear data that we can communicate to these people that it helps us provide solutions. You've got to be active in reading the CDC websites. You've got to visit the instrument manufacturers and, and learn about the cleaning. You've got to have um, relevant understanding of what's happening in other states and other districts so that you can say, this is how others are solving the problem. But beyond that, you've got to collect data, data on your program and your assets. You know, I was, I was talking, um, um, to my uh, webinar last night, and I said, I can make the argument that band, and I'll use band, and I apologize, it happens to be my crick there. I can make an argument that band is the safest place for schools to be. And, and, and she said, well, how can you do that? I said, oh, it's simple. I said, first of all, let's start with the square footage. I just checked the CDC website. It's recommending 12 square feet minimum distance for each child, 12 cubic square feet per child. The average classroom, and I Googled this, is about 400 square feet. 400 square feet, if you understand that, you know, you start to look at how many children, you, you can put about, um, you can put about 20 people inside, um, you know, uh, 22 people inside a classroom if it's 400 square feet. If you factor in the teacher desk, the whiteboard, you have to take away square footage, you bring that down. It's roughly about 18 people that you should put in a classroom in a 400 square foot classroom. My last class at the last place I taught was 2,300 square feet. It was 70, it was 70 by 37 feet. I, at the most time, at the most time, I had 52 people in my top band that that was the largest class if I didn't rehearse the marching band inside. At the most time, that equated to literally, it was close to 40 square feet per child. I have more square footage in my facility than you have in any place in the building. By the way, access and egress, yeah, um, I have a building that accesses outside doors. I have three doors. I have double doors. They open up twice as wide. I can actually ingress and egress to, to an in and out of those things. By the way, if you look at staffing, if you look at my marching band, when the students are in the marching band, I have a local staffing of nine to one. If you're 18 kids in an English class, you don't have that staffing. I can virtually guarantee you they will social distance. I chart the drill according to the social distance that will be eight feet apart. I can run rehearsals every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. My freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, I guarantee I'll be only teaching every fifth drill spot. And I guarantee they won't be touching each other. They won't be hanging out together in the parking lot. You know why? It's called parade rest. They don't move. They don't talk until I tell them to move and talk. So you can have them out in the parking lot, hanging out at the Chick-fil-A within three feet of one another, or you can give them to me and I can guarantee their safety. I can guarantee social distancing. I can guarantee they won't be near each other. I can guarantee they won't be talking. I can guarantee they won't be holding hands. If you care about children, you will put them in my class. And if they don't play music, give them to me. I'll teach them music. But more than that, I'm going to make them safe. I'm going to eat up time that they won't be depressed. They won't be gaining. They won't be lonely. I'm going to give them a sense of connectivity to their community and to their school that makes them feel alive, makes them feel relevant, and doesn't make them feel isolated. Not only is it the right thing to do for the school, it's the right thing to do for kids. And it can be done safely. I don't want to talk about what we can't do. I want to talk about what we should do and how we do it. But we have to recognize the vulnerabilities. We have to understand that being in choir, being in orchestra, being in band, making music does present issues. And it will be different for each one of you based on your facilities, based on your activity, based on your age range. I mean, my, I was like, oh my goodness, and we got to fix this in high school, this. My wife said, high school is not your problem, Scott. I was like, what do you mean? She said, how are we going to keep kindergartners from touching one another and maintaining social distance? I was like, 
Oh, never thought about that one. That's the real nightmare, elementary schools. You've got to think about this, but you've got to approach it of, I'm not interested in what we can't do. Tell me, Mr. Administrator, so we can attract the right type of kids. What do you want this school to look like? And then let me help you build it. I want to talk about what's right for kids and then how do we build it? And I believe, and I can make a rational, mathematical, scientific argument that every child in school should be in the arts, period, the end, period, the end. We used to have 20% are involved in the arts. I'll make an argument that in this pandemic, it should now be 100%. It should be required. You know, and my, 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 uh, my friend said, well, our school's talking about um, it's just going to be English and math all day and all teachers are going to teach that. And I said, that makes no rational sense. She said, well, we've got to get the basics. I said, yes, but those are things that can be taught remotely. We should be teaching things on our campus that can't be taught remotely. Why are we bringing kids to school that doesn't require a school to teach it and sending kids home for things that require a school to teach it? Let's get off Z and let's get to A. Now, some of the data you're going to need to start collecting comes from your students. You need to do a survey. You need to have the following questions on your survey. And I have prepared this list very carefully for very specific reasons. You need to talk to the kids about, are you planning on being in, in music next year? Are you planning on being a part of this activity? And how has COVID impacted that? Number two, how safe do you feel right now? And what precautions do you need from me to make you feel safe to be in my environment? Parents are scared. I mean, they're scared and they should be. I'm scared. I got a little kid, I got two of them. What will make, and I say to my wife, we're gonna go out and play football. Well, you shouldn't. I said, what will make you feel safe, Leah? Well, if you wear his gloves and you wash your hands. Okay, we'll do that. Tell me what will make you feel safe. And then the next one's really important. How important is music and their decision to return to campus? So imagine when they say, well, gosh, we're thinking about eliminating the activities. And I say 97.5% of my students say they're going to a sister school if you do that. 92.1% of my students say that this is the most important part of their school day. 100% of my parents feel that music is important to the well-rounded school experience and they'll be seeking that in another environment if they can't have it here. We've got to have that data when an administrator says, well, we've got to do what, what's safe for kids and parents. And I say, 100% of my parents believe that it's already safe. You're engaging in pandemic theater. You're creating an obstacle that doesn't exist. And if the obstacle exists, I'm learning from this data what will remove the barrier. Tell me, parents, and then I'll tell you what I've already done. Square footage, change. Well, we're worried about the clamp. What about the chairs? We'll do rehearsal standing up. I'll limit. What about the music stands? You're going to clean? Nope, I'm going to require every kid to buy a wire stand and label it with the name. They're only going to have their stand. All music will be copied and it'll be disposed. I will solve every problem if you tell me what your concerns are. You're going to want to have a question in a comment box, and you're going to want to be able to segment it. So you want to know, are they a student? Are they a parent? Are they middle school, elementary school, high school? Are they currently enrolled? Are they coming in? Are they eighth? You're gonna to wanna to segment it so that you can take that data and disaggregate it. And remember your coalition, your coalition is built broad and wide. So you're gonna collect data for athletics. You're gonna collect data for activities. You're gonna collect data for drama, but then you're gonna to wanna to be able to segment it so that when it comes time to share that information, you can break it apart and use what's relevant to that moment. Now, please understand, please understand, this survey, this data should not be collected by you. You are a professional educator. You are an employee of your district. You act under their guise and you act at their direction. You need to have a communications officer for each area, the band, the choir, the orchestra, middle school, elementary school, that is acting on that behalf. That when it's asked, well, we didn't want you to collect that, you said, I didn't, my booster group did. They wanted to know this information. Now, am I a resource? Absolutely I am. Do, did I communicate with them? Absolutely I did. Did I? put together a survey and send it out? I absolutely didn't. The thing is, you are first and foremost an employee of your school. And we have to be professional and responsible with that role. But that doesn't mean that we can't use our expertise to protect our programs 
and protect our students. You're gathering data so that you can better serve your community and better serve your students. So step one, we've got to insert ourselves in the conversation. Step two, we've got to get educated and become experts. Step three, we've got to build that coalition. Step four, we've got to start to provide solutions. So now that we've got all this information, we're armed with all this data, we've got the audience ready to go, we've got the, now we've got to actually prepare the plan so that when they say, we have a problem with X, I have a solution at Y. You're at Z, I'm at A. I need to get you to Y. Then I need to get you to X. Then I need to get you whatever letters before X because I can't do a webinar and think backwards. I'm not gonna read these to you. I want you to just look at them and know that you can print these out on your slide deck. But like I said, and some of the solutions I, I just came up with, the wire stands, we'll stand, we won't sit. I'll spread the group out. They'll stand at parade. There are real solutions. I've yet, I've yet to come up with a problem that I couldn't figure out a solution for when it relates to music and, um, and participation. And to be honest, I know it sounds crazy. The, the most vulnerable, the vo vulnerable activity right now is, is, is let's say football and choir. In football, I would go to a seven on seven uh, passing league. I would eliminate all touch. If you don't know flag football, wherever you catch the ball, it's dropped, you don't touch. Everyone wears gloves. I'd extend the uniforms to enter a microbial. I'd have them go all the way. To I couldn't come up with a solution to that. Is it gonna look different? Yes. If I have to buy, what is it? N9, N91 masks for everyone inquired, that's what I'll do. I'll figure it out. Tell me what the problem is. I'll come up with the solution. There, again, the key thing you wanna get your, your decision-making team to is what is important for kids and how do we make it safe? When we build a school, we don't go, well, what's the easiest to build? We say, what does the school need? Let's figure out how to build it. It's the same thing. What do our kids need and how do we figure out how to build it? We are the experts. It is incumbent upon us, upon us to not only see the problem, but solve the problem and then communicate the problem, which is the next step. Communicate and collaborate. That once we have all this information, what do we do with it? Well, we've got to have a communication chair who manages the flow of that information, who coalesces the flow of that information and who validates it, who reaches out to the sister district band director and says, what are you guys doing over there? What are you hearing? Someone who goes to the national websites and gets the latest information, the latest data, the someone who goes and takes the information I've presented it and disseminates it across the arts organizations in your district so that the choir teacher, the, the orchestra teacher, and, and the drama teacher and the dance teacher are on the same page. Then they, they disaggregate it and break it down, decide what's relevant to who and whether it needs to be shared individually or collectively. There might be a time and a place when you, as an entire collegium, stand in front of your school board and say, it's not okay to cut the athletics, the activities, and the arts. Or maybe it's a single meeting with just the music teachers and the administrator. But what you need to do is have that ready and understand what's relevant at that moment. And then use only that information and communicate in a very clear and consistent way. You've also got to document everything that you are planning on doing, have done, and will do. So that in the moment's notice, when someone says, well, how are we dealing with students? Here's how we deal with student safety. Oh, here's my plan for dealing with rehearsal scheduling. Oh, here's my plan for dealing with facilities. Oh, here's my plan with disinfecting. Oh, here's my plan with instrument sanitation. Oh, it's already prepared. It's in documented form. I can email it. I can text it. I can share it on social media. I'm going to become the advocate for my program that I was meant to be. So you get the group together, you assign a chairperson, you gather that data, you document it and store it in a single place so that it can be shared effectively and quickly by preparing one sheet with relevant data in each of the area. Oh, you have a question about sanitation? Here's my one sheet. Oh, you have a question about uh, educational implementation? Here's my one sheet. Oh, you have a question about dealing with uh, seating in the music stand and the, and the grandstands and riding a bus? Here's my one sheet. Oh, you have a question about um, uh, facility and social distancing? Here's my one sheet. That you need to have the one sheet 
with not only the, the data relating to health and safety, but the one sheet relating to what the parents and students are thinking and feeling. 96% of, of my students say that they'll seek alternative educational environments if music isn't a part of their day anymore. 92% of my students say if there's not music, then they're just gonna go to an online school. 92% of my son, I, my son goes to a high school down the street. There are four high schools within a similar driving distance. And if one of them figures out music, that's where my kid's gonna go. Be the one that figures out music. Because where the music kids go is where the AP kids go. Where the music kids go are where the student government kids go. Where the music kids go are where the, the honors kids go. Where the music kids go are where the IB kids go. You want music kids on your campus because once they leave, they won't ever come back. And neither will their brothers and neither will their sisters. They will go to the person who doesn't ask the question, what's safe? They will go to the person that says, what's good for kids? I'll make it safe. We want kids to be safe. There is nothing more important than that. And if you can come up with a problem that I can't solve, I will raise my white flag. I don't think you can though. I haven't found anybody who's come up with a problem I couldn't solve yet. We have to be rational and we have to figure in more than physical safety. We have to figure in emotional safety and mental health is a part of our decision-making process. So understanding this, there are people who are already taking advantage of this situation. Politics aside, the private school movement, the charter school movement will use this as an opportunity. And frankly, if I were a public school principal, I would use it as well. Because if I lose 100 kids, I lose three teachers. If I lose 200 kids, I lose six teachers. If I, if I lose the music kids, I lose my honors program. I'm going to figure this out. There will be people who will follow the trail of money, which means follow the trail of kids. It's sad, but it is true. Be prepared for these people. Next thing is you want to make sure that you're mindful of the harbinger effect and the impacts it's going to have on school recruiting. That people will follow like people. People who love athletics will travel with people who value athletics. Our schools are harbingers. What is our school a harbinger for? Is it a harbinger for the arts? Is it a harbinger for the mind, the body, and the soul? Is it a harbinger for the total high school experience, proms and, and pep assemblies and, and rallies and announcements and volleyball games? If we believe that in our soul, then let's figure out how to make it work so that we attract people who believe in those things in their soul so that we're truly community high school serving a specific community. Use the parents and the students' voice. They're the ones that are gonna be heard the loudest. Talk to your students, talk to your parents, gather real data, really listen to the, their concerns, really listen to their voices, and then add a megaphone to it. Imagine that, that they're the student and the parent and you're the instrument your job is to make what they do louder. I mean, that's what we do. Be an advocate for your program. Be a member of the school team. You know, the thing I say in, in my previous webinar is play chess now, play Tetris later. Great chess players can think five steps in advance. They know what you're going to do on Tuesday, even though it's Thursday. You've got to think through every obstacle that's in your path, every concern an administrator, community member, governing board member's gonna have, and you've got to have a solution for it before they present the problem. You're playing chess now. I'm thinking through August now in order to be effective today. And then play Tetris. That when they come up with a solution, you fill the void they give you. If they tell you, you're gonna get the kids for 30 minutes every third day. All right, I'll figure it out. You can do this, but you can't have uh, a choir of larger than 50. Okay, I'll, I'll figure it out. You can do this, but all your classes have to be outdoor. All right, I'll figure it out. It, but it's Arizona. I'll figure it out. Give me kids and give me time. I'll take care of it. That's my job. I am the expert, and I believe what I do matters. So I'm going to make it work. I'm a part of your team, Mr. Administrator, Mr. Superintendent, Mr. Governing Board Member, and I will fight like a rabid honey badger for my program. But in the end, I will work with you 
to not only provide solutions, but to work within the framework that you give me. Be an advocate for your program, but be a member of the school team. Now, when we're done here in just a few minutes, I want you to get off this meeting and go to work immediately. Follow the five step process. Become a part of the process, email. And I will get that. If you don't feel comfortable writing the email, that will go out um, maybe later today or tomorrow. I had planned for Sunday, but maybe you need it sooner. A four-step email, an email to parents, an email to boosters, an email to your superintendent, an email to your governing board, and an email to your colleagues. Insert yourself in the process today. Ask for the meeting on Tuesday. We'll worry about Tuesday the next four days. Get the meeting now. Because if you ask for it on Tuesday and they schedule it for next Friday, the decision may have already been made. Step one, become part of the process. Step two, build your consortium. Build it, cast the net wide and vertical across many disciplines, across many schools, across many counties, and vertical, K, elementary, middle school, high school, admin, district office, governing board, politics, governor, supreme leader of the universe. Three, you have five days to become the expert and collect data. And it's out there, folks. It's out there. And if you need help, get call me. Don't email me. My email box is out of control. Call me. I'll help you find the information you need. I have some of it. This slide deck is full of it. Um, Google it. Talk to your colleagues. Become the expert and be solutions-based. There is no problem that you can't come up with that I can't provide a solution. If I can't provide the solution, I will figure it out. You know, it's the Apollo 13 uh, movie. They're going to dump up. Uh, we've got to build a respirator that will clean the air using only these parts in 12 hours. And they did it. They did it. They did it. We've got to make music a part of the school day without having kids closer than X feet, only every three days, outdoors, not using school equipment uh, on only full moons. All right. I'll do it. I'll figure it out. Give me the parts. I'll do it. And then communicate everything that you're doing and collaborate with everyone that you know. Follow the step-by-step -step process, but start today, immediately, right now. And you can do it because realistically, who is better prepared to adapt and pivot the way music? Improvisation is a part of who we are. Think if you're an English teacher and you've taught Beowulf the same way for 32 years. That doesn't work for music teacher. Even if it doesn't work from quarter to quarter as you teach new music, it doesn't work from class to class as you teach jazz, marching, concert, a cappella, chamber music, the full symphony. You're used to pivoting on your feet. You're used to improvising. We are prepared better than anyone to do this better than anyone on our campuses. You can do this. In a, if you don't know what you're doing, reach out to your choir teacher. They're a bulldog, go get them. If you don't know what you're doing, reach out to a parent. If you don't feel comfortable, there is someone who can help you. There is someone, but when we, but this is the moment we show our, st our students who we really are. I will fight for you and I will fight for this program because I've always told you I loved you and I've always told you we're a family and that's what you do. But I will do it in a professional, respectful, responsible way. Our world is filled with people screaming at one another with hate speech. Our world is filled with the right and the left demonizing and, and trying to segment each other. I will not put down athletics. I will not advocate for the arts over activities. I will advocate for my program. I will advocate for my students and I will do it in a professional and responsible way. And I will do it in a way that, that espouses civil discourse and kindness. But I will not engage in pandemic theater. I will say it one last time. I am not interested in the conversation of what is safe for students. I'm interested in the conversation of what do students need to be safe? And then how do we figure that out? And I will tell you, I believe in every, with every fiber of my being, if you really, really look at the data, the science, the mathematics, and the information, and you think logically, systemically, and clearly, every child should be in music, period, the end. Every child. And if they weren't before, put them in now. They need music.
more than ever before. And I'm not going to apologize for doing what's right for kids. I just won't do it. I won't do it. I won't do it. And neither should you. I want to thank you for coming. Um, the best thing you can do to help us, I get that question, is how can I help? BPOTM.org referral. That's where you can share the word of what we're doing. When we started this uh, COVID crisis, uh, we had uh, 14,000 teachers in our ecosystem. Uh, we now have 22,000 teachers in our ecosystem, but there are 100,000 music teachers. That means we're only serving one of every four teachers. Go to that URL, share this. We don't spam, we don't sell, we don't give away data. We, we provide real solutions to real problems like this in real time. And we can't help people if we don't know where they are. And just as is our students are isolated, you're isolated. You're a part of a community. You're one of us. I am you and you are me. And I need you to feel relevant and feel like I'm not isolated and alone, just like you need me and you need everyone that's in this room. Go to bpotm.org referral right now. Go to your social media phone and go to your social media feed and say, you've got to go to be part of the music and be a part of this movement. We're going to be sharing more information over the weekend. We're going to be sharing the next four emails. We're going to be sharing some of this data, but we can't share if they're not there, if they're not there. Last but not least, uh, I just want to thank you for being you. This has been miserable for you. It's been miserable. I've yet to talk to a teacher who says, I'm, getting, I'm, I'm working more than I ever have and accomplishing less than I ever have. I didn't get into teaching to talk to a computer screen. I didn't get into teaching to learn coding. I want to make music. It's hard on you, and I know it is. And I want you to know that you're not alone, and we're going to get through this. We will. And if we do it together, we can actually be better. Better teachers with better programs and better people. With better people. Don't accept the premise of what's safe for kids. Start with the premise of what's good for kids and how do we make it safe? Let's go from Z to A. Thank you for coming. Uh, I appreciate it. This concludes uh, our webinar. Um, and we'll be sharing more information with you uh, over the weekend. If you have questions, you can reach out to me. That's my URL, uh, scottlang.net, at scottscottlang.net. That is my cell phone. You can reach me on Twitter at, at the more you give. You can be at facebook.com at uh, Scott Lang Leadership. Um, I'm available there. And you can just pick up the phone and call me. Um, people get surprised. I respond to every email. And I pick up the phone every time it rings um, because you matter. With that being said, I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Um, only to worry about the things that you can control. I'm going to end the video portion of this meeting. I will stay in the chat box for just a few minutes to answer any questions. Andrew, if there's anything people need to know that I've forgotten or questions that I need to answer that have been in the chat box, turn on your mic now and let me know that. Nope. No, everything's pretty if good. If Andrew is silent, that means we did it all right. And I'm going to end the meeting uh, and thankful in service of you and continued service of you. And I will uh, jump on the chat box. And if anybody has any questions, I will be there. Take care, everyone. Have a great weekend. Mm -hmm.